Hello and welcome to JavaScript Marathon, a full week of free online courses in some of the leading web development technologies and concepts. Happy to introduce Rob Ozell. He's going to be our trainer today. He's going to be presenting on building Stripe apps with React, learning once, writing everywhere. Welcome, Rob. Great to be here. A bit about who we are at this dot. So this at Labs probably partners with enterprise enterprises interested in transforming their digital assets, upskilling their teams, and finding novel avenues for advanced integration. If you're interested in seeing some of our work, we have amazing clients that we're going to show in the next slide. Take a look at our portfolio page. It's at thisdot.co forward slash portfolio. Some of our amazing clients, we love our clients, and we also are hiring. If you're a senior software engineer, email us at jobs at thisdot.co. Send us your information. We'd love to hear from you. And we have a ton of upcoming events, as always. React Mentoring comes back on June 7th, as well as State of Angular Ecosystem. We have our Women in Tech Monthly Mentoring June 15th. And then we're rounding out June with State of Web Components, June 21st. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Rob. Great. Thank you, Sarah. And welcome, everybody. Thank you for taking time out of your day to watch this presentation about building Stripe apps. Now, first of all, some of you might be listening and saying, Stripe apps? I don't even know what those are. Well, you wouldn't be alone. This is a just recently announced uh, offering from Stripe, the ability to extend their platform with React-based applications. And so today, uh, my goal is to introduce this concept to you, uh, what they are and why they're interesting. Uh, why we should care about them as uh, web developers and as JavaScript developers. Then we're going to go through what are the elements of these Stripe applications and how they differ from React applications. And finally, we're going to build a new Stripe app from scratch and show you how to get into it so that you can start playing with it on your own time. Now, the first, I want to make sure that everybody's on the same page because many of you may not have ever opened up a Stripe account or seen what it looks like when you have a Stripe account. So if you were to create a developer account for Stripe, uh, just one to play around with, or if you have one for a business and you go to the main dashboard page, it's going to look a little bit like this. You're going to get access to reports and data about the payments that you've received through uh, your account. You'll have lists of payments, lists of balances and customers. You can do invoicing and products, all of the full suite of options that Stripe offers in their platform. But until now, most of the functionality and certainly all the functionality that you see on the Stripe website itself was based and developed by Stripe. Now, what they've realized is that a lot of the people that use and have Stripe accounts and to run their businesses use a lot of other tools as well. And they've discovered that these people develop work uh, flows that involve taking data from Stripe and maybe connecting it with data elsewhere or bringing two windows together or finding ways that they need systems to connect. And so in order to make that easier to do, Stripe's offered the ability to create apps, the ability to add information and behavior to the platform itself so that users inside of their Stripe accounts can see what that looks like. Now, uh, I had a animated video of this that came from the video that Stripe shared this week when they unveiled it. Unfortunately, that video uh, did not properly play when I was demoing this. So I've taken a screen cap of it to show kind of what one of these apps looks like, at least a portion of the window. We'll see this in a little bit in the demo. But what happens is the apps slide in from the side and provide additional context or behavior uh, to what the user is seeing. So you could imagine building any type of business analytics tool, uh, any other type of uh, productivity tool, or a tool that brings data from a third-party system, uh, some other uh, existing service that users that might be using, and brings that data, uh, correlates it to data in Stripe, and displays it side by side, just enabling users to really make uh, a difference in what they're trying to do. So why do I even bring this up, right? Why should we care about Stripe apps, right? You hadn't even heard about it today. Why should we care as web developers, as JavaScript developers, as React developers? Why should we care about Stripe apps? Is it because I work from Stripe or I get some sort of payment if people build Stripe apps? Absolutely not. 
I have had the opportunity to be playing around with these Stripe apps for a little while. And one of the things that really inspired me is just what a great example they are of how learning frameworks like React and learning JavaScript can just open doors to develop all sorts of new experiences all over the place. And Stripe apps in particular are a great example of doing this because building Stripe apps, just like building Shopify apps or uh, WordPress plugins, provide an opportunity for possible monetizable side projects, if that's an interest of yours. If you're a business owner, it gives you access to a large pool of potential new customers through Stripe uh, users. Or if you're a friend or relative or somebody that has one of these businesses on the side who has had pain points when using Stripe or uh, difficult workflows that they haven't been able to implement or that they wanted to automate, you now have the ability to use your coding ability to help them to develop those workflows and apps that might be able to make their lives easier and maybe the lives of other users easier as well. And of course, another reason why is because these are we should care about these Stripe apps because again, it's another reason why learning JavaScript and frameworks like React are just a great idea for uh, having just a long and productive and interesting career in any capacity that you want to. So let's briefly talk about what Stripe apps are then. We know React is involved, certainly, but what else is involved? Well, Stripe apps are built from uh, a few different rudiments. First is going to be a manifest file. Now, if you've ever developed things like a Chrome extension or even a native app before, you might be familiar with these types of manifest files. They're sort of like a collection of settings and configuration that explain how your app is going to be run by the Stripe platform. It would explain what types of permissions you need, what types of views exist, what types of icons should appear, and anything like that that's related to how your app is going to integrate with the actual Stripe platform. Another pillar is the Stripe CLI. This is going to give us the ability to scaffold new applications, to add new views to existing applications, to manage pub, uh, permissions, and ultimately to publish our application to the App Store itself. So this is going to be an invaluable tool uh, to reduce the amount of manual things that you have to do uh, and just increase uh, the comfort and the developer experience of using these things. Another pillar is the Stripe UI extension SDK. This is going to be a set of utilities for accessing Stripe APIs and doing a host of other things that you're going to find useful when dealing with uh, Stripe apps. There's going to be some parts of building a Stripe app that is not exactly like you would expect it to be from React web apps. And some of the tools inside of this SDK will help to, uh, help to alleviate some of those issues. Also, the Stripe Apps UI Toolkit. This is a component library and a design system for building Stripe apps. It's going to help out a lot, especially if you're not particularly design-minded. It's going to help you build impressive-looking applications that uh, also fit the look and feel of Stripe itself. And so this UI Toolkit is, in, is important when building apps, as we'll see. Of course, React is a big part of building these applications. That is going to be the underlying logic uh, that is producing these views and processing the data that we create in these apps. And interestingly, TypeScript. So all of these tools use TypeScript right out of the box. All the SDK libraries and uh, the components are fully typed so that you have that extra bit of developer experience as you're getting onboarded with knowing exactly what uh, these different uh, tools uh, do. All right, now, is it fair then to say that Stripe apps are just React apps? Well, kind of is the answer to that. And how are they different? Well, to understand how they're different, we have to think a little bit about how they're hosted. So first of all, you know, if you're a web developer and you've built applications before, you've prob probably spent a lot of your time making sure that your users can't run arbitrary code on your site against your users, right? This is something that people work really hard to combat. And similarly, uh, Stripe, for security reasons, does not want these apps to simply be running inside of the window itself, opening avenues for data exfiltration or any other types of manipulations or attacks against users. So what they do is they render the applications in the side viewport, but they host your actual application inside of a sandboxed iframe so that it has a reduced connections uh, to the actual page itself. All data and events that are coming from the UI are serialized and sent to your sandbox iframe so that you can process it in your code. And any views that you emit from your code are then serialized and sent back 
uh, to the Stripe platform to be rendered inside of the viewport itself. So this indirection, while it's mostly invisible to you, will impose certain restrictions that are going to make Stripe apps feel different and distinct from React applications, not in ways that will make them feel maybe completely foreign, but certainly in ways that you're going to have to be familiar with. And again, if any of you have familiarity with using or building React Native applications, you might already be familiar with this, right? Some of the things that you're rendering in a React Native application are not actually HTML DOM elements, but are native components. Some of those things that you're doing that look and represent like CSS are not actually CSS, but they function similarly to it. And what you're going to see with Stripe apps is that it's going to be very similar. So some of the gotchas that you need to know when you're working on Stripe apps, and again, just be conscious of this as you start to explore, because these are some of the things that you bump against uh, very early on when you're playing around with these things and experiencing, experimenting to see what you can accomplish. First of all, you don't have access to the DOM. This includes your DOM inside of the components that you produce, as well as the DOM elements on the Stripe page itself. At present, there is no way for the Stripe apps to manipulate the appearance or layout of the Stripe pages themselves. They're always an additional piece uh, that slides in from the side. Second, there are no standard HTML elements. This means no H1s, no anchor tags, and things of that nature. Because of the sandbox nature and the fact that our views are serialized and sent back to the main page to be rendered, we have to use the UI toolkit items that Stripe provides to build our UIs. This is going to be a little bit weird at first, but you'll see very quickly um, that you learn the new tools that you have, and they'll feel very similar to tools that you already are using to build your websites. CSS is similarly limited. You have CSS, uh, CSS property, and it does style. And many of the functionalities that you have come to expect from CSS are there, um, but some of them are not named the same, and some of them don't behave exactly the same. So there are going to be some nuanced differences. If you're working with a designer, you need to make sure that they uh, really study the Figma file that Stripe provides that lets you know how these apps uh, need to behave and how they design differently than web apps. It's going to save you a lot of headache <laughs> if your designer is on board with you. Things like uh, use ref are not allowed. This means that uh, you don't have access, again, to the underlying DOM nodes. And it means that you will also have difficulty um, getting access to all of the event handlers that are on a page. Now, Stripe components that they give you do have event handlers, um, but maybe not all of the ones that you were expecting. So some of your use cases, things like infinite scrolling or pull to refresh and things of that nature may not be natively supported by Stripe apps. And you can either make a feature request to Stripe to add those behaviors, or you're going to have to find alternative ways around that. There's also cores challenges due to the iframe origin. So because you're in a sandboxed iframe, uh, your origin is going to be blank or null. And so uh, you're going to have some difficulty accessing some of your servers depending on their cross-origin uh, security settings. So you may have to set up um, proxy and middleware or things like that that will enable you to work around these issues. Again, it's not a significant issue, but it is something you have to be aware of and something you'll probably encounter pretty early on in your development. Uh, Libraries that you use can't import React DOM. Again, this is due to uh, the implementation of how the views are rendered. And so you have to be careful sometimes with using third-party libraries. Some of them may not be available because of the absence of this library. So just be careful with the third-party tools that you choose to use, and just be aware that you may have to find ways around some li libraries or tools that you've used in the past. And finally, no access to local store cookies and et cetera. Again, this comes from the sandbox nature of the application. But you have to be aware that you can't use these ways to persist state. And so uh, their Stripe is aware of this and has provided tools such as a data store and a secret store so that you can persist things like authentication tokens and user settings and, and user preferences. However, you have to know that it's going to take a little different form than what you're used to. Now, again, Let's roll this all up and talk about why I'm excited about it before we dive into the code. And again, back in the day, there was a lot of conversation around write once and deploy everywhere. This idea that I could write one React application and just without making any changes, run it on phones and desktops and embedded systems and everything else. But what we found over time is that um, this idea doesn't fully work. Phones are materially different than um, are materially different than uh, desktops, are different from laptops, are different from embedded systems, are different from different types of platforms. And code should be custom, to be customized and to take best advantage of those platforms. 
However, the new mantra that took over was the idea of learning once and using everywhere. This idea that we can be JavaScript developers, that we can be framework developers in tools like React, and yet we can develop experiences that touch all these different uh, environments without having to learn new languages and new tools kits and things of that nature is just one of the great, exciting uh, advantages of being web developers right now. So for example, uh, we can build, of course, web apps using React. We can build hybrid native apps with React using React Native. We can build hybrid web apps with React using Ionic. Desktop apps with React using Electron. We can integrate with platforms such as Stripe using Stripe, uh, building Stripe apps with React. And even become game developers by writing Roblox games using React-like semantics using their library Roact. So you can see the time that you've taken and invested in learning these frameworks is going to open up a wealth of possibilities. And that's why technologies like this make me so excited and why I think everybody should maybe take a little bit of time to play around with Stripe apps. And with that being said, that's enough talking. Let's get to coding. So uh, give me one moment here. I'm going to take a drink. And if there's any questions in the chat, by the way, I will be happy to respond. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, San and Linda, for showing up today. Thank you so much. All right. So now here we are on my machine. Now, one of the prerequisites for uh, building a Stripe app is that you need to, imp uh, to install the Stripe CLI and a couple other basic uh, CLI tools. The instructions for how to do this and how to authenticate and make a Stripe developer account are all included on the documentation on their website. Uh, I won't go through all of that here just in the interest of time, uh, but just know that that is a prerequisite. But once you've accomplished that, you'll have access to this Stripe command inside of your uh, library. And so the very first thing that we're going to do is create a new app. So we're gonna do Stripe apps create, and we're gonna name it say JavaScript Marathon. And it's gonna start asking us a few questions. So the first is our app ID. Now this is like a unique domain-based uh, description. It's supposed to be globally, universally unique. Uh, so generally you would tie it maybe to the domain name of your site that you have access to. And here it's letting us use an example one and that is fine for us. So we're gonna accept that. Display name, this will be the name of your application as it would appear in the app store. Also as it would appear in the sidebar. JavaScript Marathon works for us for today. And now it is building out and scaffolding that application. It's a very fast process. These are very thin applications. There's not a lot of accompanying tooling that goes with it. And so this process should resolve pretty soon. And as soon as it does uh, and it's completed, we have uh, given a few instructions for what we can do now. So for example, we could start uh, using our application right away uh, using um, start, we can add new views, we can upload our app to the app store and things of that nature. We'll cover some more of these things as we go through it. But to start out, let's just see, for example, um, well, actually, I'm sorry, this would be one more thing I'm gonna do first. First, I'm gonna open up the code. Oops, it would help if I, uh... okay. The first thing that we're gonna do is I have some helpers here. Now, I know this is a little bit cheating in uh, in demos. Uh, you'll have to forgive me, but uh, there are some utilities that I need for the tool that we're gonna build that aren't relevant to building Stripe apps and would just take too much time to code on stream. Um, but I can provide them and I'll show them when they're relevant inside of the demo. But uh, give me one moment here as I unzip them. All right, we're good there. Just in case we get stuck, I got some backups. All right, so now here we are. I'm gonna kick off our code. All right, so we're gonna get the code opened up and we'll go back to this in a second. And what, we, what I wanted to do was do Stripe apps start. And so we're just gonna see what they've given us right out of the gate. Now, what happens is after you start this, it's built it and now it's saying that it wants to put this thing inside of your Stripe dashboard. Now it's gonna be doing this locally so that you can um, be playing around with this. And so it opens up and it's saying, where do you want to preview this in? Now, if you have access to multiple Stripe accounts, you'll have a drop down here. If you only have access to one, you only have access to one. Uh, so I'm going to put it inside of my personal developer Stripe account. And now my Stripe dashboard has loaded up with this application open up on the side. So 
Here's the Stripe app. I can open it. I can close it. And uh, you can see it's named JavaScript Marathon in honor of uh, this event today. And while I didn't, and, and the code that I have access to didn't put this in here, Stripe has read through our uh, manifest file where our application is supposed to be live in, and it's trying to direct users where to go. So here it's telling us to go to our list of customers, and it's telling us now to select a customer to uh, look at. And you can see that that opens up our Hello World application. Now, we didn't write any of this Hello World, uh, but this is what it's given us out of the box. So let's go now into the code and see uh, what it was doing there. So this is what it's created. It's created a source file. Now, the drafts and the utils folders are the ones that I unzipped and brought in from uh, the side. But the views folder is what it comes with, and it gives you a default uh, component called app. But first, we're going to look at the manifest file, which is this Stripe app JSON file. And what you're going to see in this file is things like the ID that we put in on the command line. You're going to see the name that we selected as well, and then see a host of other options, things like permissions, or app backend, or views in the UI extension section, or content security policy. Again, these are all the parameters and configuration that define how your Stripe app connects to the Stripe platform, as well as to uh, any backends or other third-party services that you want to use. A lot of this we're not necessarily going to cover today. It's very extensively documented. And so just know that whenever you encounter an issue where something is supposed to connect or happen in another system and it's erroring out, this is probably the place that you want to look. And this is probably the documentation that you want to uh, look at. But you can see that the default application that it, or view that it gave us is connected to this Stripe dashboard customer details view. And remember, that's where we went in the application in the website just a little bit ago to make our Hello World app appear. So what this says is what whenever a user goes to this customer details page, we're going to put it on the app component. So we're going to host the app component. Now, there's no magic here. We could call this anything we want. This could be the customer details uh, component, right? There's no magic here. It didn't have to be called app. But the fact that it was called app means that it's going to host the app piece over here uh, inside of that. So that is how that got onto the screen. So now we want to look at the app itself and see what one of these components looks like. Now, some things probably initially jumped out at you. The first thing that may have jumped out to you is that these components in these Stripe apps are just React components. They are methods that are going to return some JSX. They can accept props. So in this case, we're accepting two props by default called user context and um, environment. And uh, then we have some, some components down here in our JSX. So we have things like a context view. Now, what is a context view? You don't have to know that right now, but it's one of the UI toolkit items. A full list of all those UI components is found on the website. Again, fully documented with all the props that they take and the ways that you can manipulate them. Um, so there is a way to research what all of these things are. Just know that the context view is just the wrapper for now of the application that we're building. And things like boxes, you can think of these like divs. Things like inline, you can think of these like uh, uh, spans. Links, you can think of like anchor tags, right? So you're starting to see similarities between the types of web views that we create using HTML and these Stripe app UIs that we create using the UI toolkit. You can also see these CSS properties, which, you know, if you have a keen eye, you realize that while this looks a lot like CSS, some of the properties or some of the values are different. So we have things like height. Uh, we have things like background or border radius or things like margin and padding that we would expect. Uh, and so those feel familiar. But then we see things like stack and distribute. These are maybe named slightly differently, but these create functionality like um, uh, um, Flexbox and other types of layout mechanisms that allow us to style things appropriately. So while you don't have the full breadth of CSS at, at hand, uh, you're going to notice that a lot of the CSS that you edit will ultimately feel at least conceptually similar to the, uh, the CSS that you've been creating on the web as well. So CSS exists uh, as well. Now, I want to explain a little bit while we're here about this user context and this environment, because it's important for building other tools. And so 
what we want to do here is I'm going to come in and I'm going to delete the contents of this box. And what I'm going to do is create a new inline. And just for the sake of it, let's make this inline uh, green. And to do that, let's make it the color of success, which in this uh, design system is green. And inside of this, let's say that your name is, and let's say that this is user context dot uh, name. And let's save that. And now let's go and look at our application. Oops, I changed uh, because I was messing around in the Stripe app JSON. <laughs> it, it registered a change, so I have to rehost it. Anytime you change that app JSON, you have to rehost it. OK, and now you see it says, your name is Robert Ocell. Now, if you're watching, you're like, well, that's not my name. Well, fair enough, but that's my name. And that's the name of the account that I'm logged into. So Stripe gives us through the application, through this user context, information about the user that's currently using the application that's logged into Stripe. Get information about their ID, their name, their email, things like that. Now let's maybe duplicate this box. And uh, let's add another one. And let's instead say here, that uh, you are currently looking at. And here, instead of uh, user context, let's dig into the environment and see you know, what the object uh, is, object context, and maybe it's the uh, ID um, on and maybe let's go back into the environment and get the viewport ID. And let's just see what that does. Now here, instead of making it the color of success, let's play with some other CSS. Maybe let's try font weight. And let's make this semi-bold. Now let's save that and let's reopen the application and see what it's done. So now it says your name is Robert Assel, and it says you are looking at customer and it gives you that ID on stripe.dashboard.customer.detail. And so, you know, this isn't a necessarily a readable name, but you can see this ID matches this ID over here on the left for the current user. I understand this text is a little small. Let me make it a little bit bigger for us. Uh, all right. So what we have here now is uh, this ability to get access to the context of the page that we're on. So if you were building a view that wanted to know information about which user was being shown on screen at this moment, uh, as well as the user that's logged into Stripe at the moment, you can get access to all that. And that's going to really allow you to build vibrant views that are really contextually aware of where the user is inside of Stripe and deliver relevant information exactly as they need it. So that's what these properties are doing. Now, we're going to take a break from this. But before we do that, I do want to show one last, or no, uh, we are going to take a break from this. And I'm going to stop uh, the server for a moment because what we need to do next is we're going to add a new view. Let's talk for a second about what we'll build today. So what I want to build today is if anybody is a Twitch, I'm a big, I like watching a lot of Twitch, a lot of people playing video games online. And one of the big things about Twitch is that people like to donate or subscribe to, the, to their favorite uh, streamers. And so sometimes these streamers will have lists of who has given the most amount of donations in a given day or a week or all time to create this kind of leaderboard uh, behavior that kind of drives people to compete. And so I thought maybe that would be an interesting Stripe app. Let's produce a leaderboard that's going to tell us who are the people that have made the most purchases with us over some length of time. So to do that, let's say that we want this UI to appear on the list of all customers. So that way, when we're looking at all of our customers, we can see which of them have maybe given us the most money in a certain length of time. And maybe that inspires me to go click into their account, see what they've been purchasing, maybe reach out to them and thank them or give them other offers or things of that nature. So uh, the first step to do this is let's make a new view. So let's do Stripe apps. And uh, we need to do... Um, Stripe apps, add view, hit enter. And now it's going to give us a list of all those different viewports that exist in the system. And we can choose which one we want. Now, we just mentioned we want to do it for the list of all customers. So let's go down to customer list and hit enter. It's going to give us the opportunity to customize the name. Certainly, you can change it if you want. For now, this is good enough for us. And now it's added that view. So let's go and see what that looked like in code. What it did is it added a new component. This component does have some boilerplate in it. So let's just remove some of that boilerplate and start fresh. 
and see what a hello world looks like here. So having done this, now remember, because we've added a new view, that means that we've also added a new view to our Stripe app JSON. And because we've changed our Stripe app JSON, that means we have to rehost this thing. So we've now restarted it. And we are going to host it in my test account. And now when we go to the list of all customers, there's our hello world. So we've added a new view um, to our account. Now let's make sure that our other account or our other view still works. Sure enough, if we go into a customer details, we see that first page, the default page it gave us. And if we go back out to the list of all customers, we now get this new one that we're working on. And that's another part of the magic of Stripe apps is that you do have this ability to host different views depending on where in Stripe a user is. Uh, and again, really giving you that ability to have fine-grained control over what users see as they navigate throughout the application. All right, just to show what might happen, let's just prove, you know, it, it's always great to trust but verify. Sure, that's what we say these days. So let's make sure that I can't just make this really big by making this an H1. If I was to save this and run it, you're going to get an error message. And the error message is that it doesn't support an H1. Normal HTML uh, tags are not supported in Stripe apps. And if you attempt to use one, it's going to give you a friendly little warning here that it says it can't render it appropriately. And so we're gonna, we ha would have to use uh, Stripe apps to do similar things. Now, that doesn't mean that Stripe apps don't have accessibility and things like that. We won't cover all the accessibility features today, uh, but there are provisions for a lot of that as well. So if you're using certain HTML tags for accessibility reasons, um, there is accessibility um, documentation as well. All right, so we have this basic application. Now, what do we need to do? The first part here might be that we want to get some data. So in order to get some data, we are going to start, uh, first of all, let's change this title. Let's just call this a leaderboard. So instead of being hello world. And what we're going to do then is we'll delete this out. So now our hello world view is empty and we need to start getting some information. Now to do that, we have to get data out of the Stripe API. To get data out of the Stripe API, uh, we need to get access to an instance of the Stripe API or the Stripe SDK as it were. And so we're going to create a new Stripe, and uh, we're going to use the Stripe API key, which is just a basic thing uh, that comes included in the SDK. And we need to pass it some settings. Now, first of all, we need to tell it where to get Stripe from. Oopsies. And uh, Stripe gets imported from Stripe. So import Stripe from Stripe. So we're going to create a new Stripe instance for the SDK, and we're going to store it here. We need to do some configuration, though, because we're going to connect to the API. So we need to get an HTTP client. Now, you don't have to think like, wow, how did he know to do this? This is all straight out of the documentation and examples. So um, if you're trying to figure out how to connect to backends, this information will be available uh, right through the documentation. And you need the API version. Now, this is just to make sure that apps don't break in case Stripe uh, implements a new version of their API. If you, these don't change all that often, but if you ever need to know what the current API is, uh, you can look on their documentation and it will tell you that the current version right now is 2020.0827. And if there were newer versions, you could see what the differences were if you're ready to update. As soon as you're ready to update, change the version and your tool will work just fine. But that's to avoid breaking changes in apps. So now we have this new Stripe instance. What we want to do next is, uh, create a method by which we can get uh, uh, payments. So to create a leaderboard of people who have given us money, we need to figure out where we've received money from. So to do that, we're going to get uh, what they're calling charges, or you can understand them as payments as well. And so to do this, we're going to create an async method. It's async because it's contacting an API, a, a remote API. If you want to do this through promises, you can. I'm going to do it through async await. And so I'm going to do a try catch block. It's always good when you're working with asynchronous code to an async and await to catch your errors and log them to the console. Uh, and then in this case, I'm actually going to return an empty array. So I want this method to return something, even in error cases, so that the rest of my code can expect to, to not break and not have to handle a null, a null case. 
Uh, and so to do this, I need to get a response. And where do I need to get a response from? I need to get a response from the API. And that API I'm going to get courtesy of that Stripe object I created up above. So I can do Stripe dot. And now look, because of the TypeScript typing, I now have this built-in documentation of exactly what I can get out of the APIs. So in this scenario, I want charges. So I'll hit charges. And then my options are to get lists or create or retrieve or update. In this case, we're going to do a search feature. And search is going to give me a couple options, which again is all documented in the, the TypeScript and also in the API docs. But we're going to create a query parameter and we're going to say created. So we want all payments that were created within some time range. For now, we're going to say that were created since second millisecond zero at the beginning of time, give me all payments. So this is just an easy way of saying, give me all payments, but later we'll extend this to be different time periods. And we're going to do one other trick here, which is to say that we're going to expand. And what are we going to expand? We're going to expand the data customer record. So each one of these payments is going to have a customer record, which is going to be an ID that points to a customer record. And instead of having to like get those IDs and then make separate calls to the back end, we can have Stripe get that information together for us and send it back as one lump sum. Now, again, it's not magic how I knew this stuff. Uh, there's API documentation that explains what is in these uh, responses from the APIs and also uh, documentation about how to expand uh, properties. So all this stuff you can find in the documentation. But suffice it to say that what comes back from this API is going to be a record that has a data property. That data property is going to be a collection or an array of different charges or payments that we've received. That each one of those entries is going to have a customer entry, which needs to be expanded to have all of the data of that customer. And that's what we're asking for here. Now, at the conclusion here, we're going to take the response, the data, which again, remember the data, and then we're going to map it to a function called minimize stripe charge. Now, this is one of those utility methods that I unzipped at the beginning of this whole thing. Don't worry about it. All it does is just trim away extra fields so that we're not confused as we're working on this right now. We only need a couple of relevant fields. And so this just trims it down to those, again, just for simplicity of the demo. So now we've produced a method that will get data from an API. OK, so now how are we going to get that data into our component? What do people think? Well, if you answered, we're going to use React, you'd be correct. So we need to create a place to put this data. So we're going to need a place to put a leaderboard and to set a leaderboard. And we're going to do that through use state. Now, this use state is going to be a leaderboard entry array. Now, again, don't, uh, and uh, it's going to be a null, uh, an empty collection by default. This is something that I created in that utility section that I brought in. Again, it's just um, some typing to make some of the IntelliSense easier for us here. Uh, it's a name, an ID, how many charges, how many payments somebody has given us total, uh, the total amount of money that that represented, and the highest payment that they've given us. So that's just a way to roll that up. OK, so that's where we're going to set the state. We know we have to call a back end. That sounds like a side effect. So we're going to use our good, trusty friend, use effect. We want this effect right now to only fire once. So we're going to have an empty uh, dependency array for now. Uh, and we're going to put inside of it a construct leaderboard method, which is another async method. Again, if you would like to use um, promises, you're welcome to. And what this method is going to do, we're going to wrap it in try catch because we want to be good, uh, good stewards of our code here. And we'll log that error if one appears. And uh, so what we're going to do here is we're going to get the list of charges using that method up above that we just created. Uh, we need to make sure that we await it. <laughs> and then we're going to put inside of our leaderboard state up there the result of generating the leaderboard from that list of charges. OK, so let's talk about this for just a second. Generate leaderboard. You haven't seen me code that. So we're going to go into that. And what this is is uh, it's just a method that's looping over those charges and keeping track of who sent each one, 
uh, and how much it is and, and just tracking all those statistics. Uh, and so it's, it's just a reducer function that goes over the list of charges, reduces it, and then sorts the resulting set by who gave the most to who gave the least. Okay. So this method, um, we could walk through it, but again, none of this is pertinent, pertinent or relevant to Stripe apps themselves. This is just pure JavaScript code. Um, about running through a collection and basically reducing it to get metrics and data out of it. So we set the leaderboard based on generating information about that data, that data that we retrieved from the Stripe API via the Stripe SDK that we've instantiated here. And we've stored all this data inside of this component using React. Now, how can we check to make sure that this is working? Well, let's console log the leaderboard and see what happens. So we can save this. And now we can go back to our uh, our file. And nothing happens. But if we open up our console, you can see that our arrays came back empty. Now, that's weird. Maybe it is the case that we haven't received any payments. But in this case, I definitely have a lot of test payments in this account. Why is it returning nothing? Well, it's returning nothing because... It's returning nothing because of an error it's not displaying. Why is it not displaying my error? Oh, <laughs> it's not displaying my error because it never called my method. So don't forget, if you're going to make an async method inside of an effect, you actually have to call it. There we go. We called it. Now we can go back here, and we can see that the array is still empty. I was expecting it to be empty but we get the actual error that I was looking for, which is that you do not have the required permissions for this endpoint. Well, that's interesting. What permissions do I need? Well, it turns out that to get different data out of the um, APIs, you need to specify which permissions you want based on the type of data that you're getting. So that way when users in, in, uh, install your Stripe app, they can decide whether they want to give your app that level of permissions. So in this case, I need to get charges. So I need the charge read. And I need to get customers, so I need to get the customer read prop, uh, permission. Now, how am I going to do this? We can do Stripe apps. Uh, I believe it's grant permission. Yeah, grant permission and uh, permission. And we want to make sure that we do um, what the permission is. So in this case, it's charge read. And then we want to make sure that we do uh, a little description that explains why we want the permission. This is just for users. It's not magical in any way. So we'll ask for that permission, and we're granted it. And we can grant the permission for the customer read. And we're going to get granted that. And now we need to um, restart it and rehost it. But in the meantime, let's look at what that did in the app JSON. You can now see that I have permissions entered here inside of my Stripe app JSON. If I just wanted to add them here, I could. But the CLI helps guide us through that process and make sure that we enter things correctly and syntactically correct. So it's a great way to do that. Um, and now if we go back, we rehost the application. And when it loads and we go to the customers page and open up our sidebar, we should now see, here we go, our leaderboard. So here are our customers and how much they've spent and out of how many charges. Okay, so the next step in creating a leaderboard is to, well, actually have a leaderboard. Well, we can do that with a list component. So let's go back to our, uh, our application and let's come into here. And in this empty space that we've left, let's make a list. And for this list, it's going to have a content. And that content is going to be the, whoop, whoop, whoop. It would help if I put my fingers on the right keys. Uh, we're going to go over the state of the leaderboard. And on the each entry of the leaderboard, we want to return a list item. And a list item has a value. This is going to be something that's offset to the right. And it's going to be a string value that is the entry total amount divided by 100. Now, the reason to be divided by 100 is because the values in the API are in integer sense, US uh, sense. Uh, and so we divide by 100 to get uh, integer dollars, or well, to get dollars. 
Then we need, because we're in React and we're iterating over a, a collection, we want to make sure that we put a key and uh, put some other things that the API needs from us. We can put some other style things like the title. And we can put a secondary title, uh, which we'll do across uh, entry.totalcharges uh, payments. All right, so now what we've done is that for each entry in the, oops, and then I always forget to close the list item. Uh, and let's format that. Always a good idea. So now for each entry in the list, um, we're going to create a list item. Now, what is it complaining about? It's complaining uh, that we did not uh, import the list from the SDK. Uh, it's not complaining about list item because I think it already pulled that in. Sometimes it does it automatically in my VS code. Sometimes it doesn't. So anyways, we've imported both of these components now. And so now for each entry in the leaderboard, it's going to create a list item. So let's see what that did. If we go back to uh, the UI, come on now. Oh, I didn't hit save. It helps to hit save. When the data comes in, we're going to see now a list of payments. So now we've created our rudimentary leaderboard. So for all time, uh, these customers um, have given us this uh, these amounts of payments. All right. So that covers that portion. Now, let me double check that. Yeah, created greater than. I feel like I'm expecting more money than that. <laughs> but we'll run with this for now. All right. So what can we do next? Well, what if we did a spinner, right? Spinners are pretty common. So what if we said when we get, uh, let's, you know, it's, I keep seeing um, our good friend David Korshid from uh, X State saying, you know, don't do an is loading uh, property, but uh, he'll have to forgive me because I'm going to do one. Uh, so for now, I'm going to do a use state false for whether I'm loading. And right before we call out to the API, I'm going to do set is loading to true. And right afterwards, I'm going to do set is loading to false. And this is going to put up a spinner for when we are um, loading. And when we do that, then we're going to say that uh, when we're loading, we want to um, create a spinner. Now, to create a spinner, uh, all you need to do is add a spinner object. And it's just going to animate a spinner. And uh, we need to make sure that we import that spinner. And so uh, now I can format my code. All right, so now if we were to go back and look at this code, you can see when it's loading, the spinner is sort of off to the side. Maybe we don't like the way that that looks. So maybe we'll put it in a box, which remember is very much like a div. And for this box, we'll put a CSS property, which is going to be an object. And let's give it a layout of column, which is going to make it be basically like a flexbox column. Uh, we're going to tell it to align x center, align y center. I think one of I think the this align y isn't going to be relevant because I did column, but um, anyways, yeah, I, I can actually just delete this. It doesn't do anything in column mode. Uh, and so if I format this, save. Now it's going to put the spinner in a slightly better location, which I can close this and reopen it. And you can see that spinner in a slightly better location. So, you know, stylistically, again, we have a lot of capability in the CSS, uh, not infinite flexibility, but again, we have quite a bit of flexibility. Now, this is an interesting thing for the leaderboard, but, you know, there's not a lot of like dynamic behavior here. So maybe we want to add some filters to this property and we want to allow users to select a certain time range uh, in which they want to um, retrieve the results from. So like today's rankings, yesterday's rankings, all time rankings. And so let's uh, do that. Now to do that, that sounds an awful lot like we need a dropdown box. So let's add that, right? So let's start by creating a, a place for this, which is going to be a box. Whoops, whoops, a box. 
And then from the box, we're going to uh, add in a select. And inside of select, we need to add options. And so we're going to add um, some options with some text. And we're going to have uh, four of these. And um, again, this is going to be using some utilities that I had produced ahead of time. We're going to do time range dot all. And hopefully it, there we go. It's questioning where I got that from. That's where I got it from. Time range dot today. Time range dot uh, yesterday. And time range dot this month. And so here we can do all today, yesterday, this month. And uh, so now we've set up our selects. Now we want to put a default value here. And so the default value will be all by default. So here we go. There's that. Let's see that that got rendered. See, now we have a dropdown. It doesn't do anything, but it lets us pick from a list of options on what we're trying to do here. Now we need to make sure that the current value is stored in, um, in state. Uh, and so what we want to do here is uh, add a place for it to be in state. So const uh, time range, set time range equals use state. And again, our default was all. Okay, so we have a place to put it. Now in this select, again, remember, we don't have all, uh, um, we don't have all uh, events available to us, but we do have some. And so we have the on change, and that's going to get in an event. And we're going to just set the time range directly from this. We're going to do e.target.value. So again, if you've used inputs in the web, this should feel very familiar. And just for the sake of the um, TypeScript, we're going to say that this is actually a time range value. And we know that because we've selected them down here. And so this state value is going to be updated every single time that users pick something different from the box. Another thing that we might want to do is maybe add some CSS in here. Oops, let me uh, say enter. And we'll do some stuff like give it a cool new background. And maybe we want to add some padding to it. And uh, again, do some alignment to center things. And maybe we're going to do a column layout so that it kind of does some nice stuff there. And we're going to do a small gap. And what we want to do is put some text here that says like filter leaderboard by time period. And let's save that and just see that that looks OK. It looks all right as it loads up. Do today all. It's great. And uh, going back then to the code, we need to make this time that we select actually affect something. And so to do that, we need to change the data that we get, right? So right here, we were getting, uh, at the top, we were getting all data. Now we need this thing to take a time range. Uh, and so what we want this to do is to uh, affect this value. And this is going to be called get epoch value for time range start range. Now, again, this is a utility that I created that's just munging data for simplicity's sake. <laughs> don't, don't worry about it too much. But it's going to get an epoch value. Now, this uses epoch seconds instead of epoch milliseconds. So there's some divide by 1,000 in there too. Um, it's a whole thing, but it's all in the documentation. And so now, if I pass in a time range, uh, I will get data for that time range. Now, down here, we didn't pass a time range. So for now, let's do time range all. And let's save. And let's verify, first and foremost, uh, that uh, that still works. So you can see the app still works, even with the changes that we've made. But when we change it, it's not going to do anything yet. So next, we need to say that this needs to pass in the current time range. And so that will pass in the current time range. But again, there's something that we're missing. And it is now, you can almost see the little warning down here. Uh, that it depends on time range. So when time range changes, we want this effect to re reoccur. And uh, we want to um, 
clear out the old data and fetch new data for the new time range. And uh, we can get rid of this console log statement as well. So now when we go back here, we're going to see that we should be able to hit uh, yesterday and get information, today's information, and maybe this month's information. And so there you go. So what you can see is um, we were able to add this sort of dynamic behavior. And again, a lot of what you just saw me do was all basic React. We could continue on from here and add even more features. Uh, we could make it so that when we go into customers, we see what their, you know, when they ordered the most products or what their best month was or what their streak was as far as how many months in a row, right? We can continue to build this gamified leaderboard concept using uh, React concepts built on top of these um uh, Stripe UI toolkit items. So hopefully that example was inspiring and interesting to all of you. If you are interested, please do go to uh, stripe.com into their developer section. Inside of their developer tools documentation, there is a Stripe app section with uh, create an app and that walks you through the whole process of getting started. All you have to do is make a Stripe account. It's, it's You don't have to buy like a developer license or anything like that. Like I said, it's just totally fun to play with just to see what the possibilities are and to challenge yourself to take your re existing React knowledge into a new environment and adapt it slightly to see what you can accomplish in a new environment. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to take it. But otherwise, what I would do is draw everybody's attention um, to um, uh, our website at this dot, this dot labs. So on this dot labs, we've actually published an, an additional set of uh, blog posts this week uh, talking about um, other aspects of building a Stripe app. So things like how to build it connected to a backend, advanced tips and tricks, how to structure applications, things of this nature. So if you want more in-depth information about how to build these Stripe apps, certainly look for us at this dot, uh, dot co and, and look up, uh, this dot labs, excuse me, uh, and, and you'll be able to find it or look us up on Twitter at this dot labs. Uh, we've been posting links to those blogs this week as well uh, to celebrate the launch of these apps. Well, uh, if there are no questions, then that is it for us today. Thank you, everybody, for attending this edition of the JavaScript Marathon. My name has been Rob Osell. You can find me on Twitter at uh, right there, Rob Osell. Please reach out to me. Let me know how you're getting on with these apps. Let me know if something interested you or if you'd like to see another exploration of Stripe apps in the future and a particular part of it. Maybe we'll come back and explain how to build a backend that connects to third-party resources, connect authentication, and all that sort of fun stuff. Uh, but for today, I think this will do it for us. So thank you, everybody, for attending and hope to see you at the next JavaScript Marathon. Bye-bye.